Welcome to Short Talks from the Hill, a research podcast of the University of Arkansas. My name is Matt McGowan. I'm a science writer here at the university. Today, I'd like to welcome Jill Weber Lenz. Lenz is the Robert A. Leffler Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development at the University of Arkansas School of Law. She is a leading expert on legal recognition and treatment of stillbirth. Lenz has written about stillbirth within the contexts of tort law, remedies law, criminal law, maternal health care, and reproductive rights and justice. Welcome, Jill, and thank you for being here. All right, thanks for having me. So back in 2020, a couple years ago, you published a seminal article arguing that uh, women have a right to know about the risk of stillbirth. Can you talk about this research, uh, maybe starting with some basic statistics about stillbirth and a little bit of background on the issue? Yeah, sure. Um, so stillbirth is a pregnancy loss, but it's sort of the lesser known uh, pregnancy loss. Uh, most people are familiar with miscarriage, and a lot of people, I think, fa- think every pregnancy loss is a miscarriage. But technically, medically, the definition uh, is the miscarriage is a pregnancy loss in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy, and then it's called a stillbirth if it's after 20 weeks. Miscarriage is way more common, which is another reason people are more familiar with it. But stillbirths still do happen. Um, they happen even in high-income countries. It's about one in 160 pregnancies ends in stillbirth. So it's very rare. It's very rare. But when you translate that to how many pregnancies we have, that's still a lot of stillbirths. And it's usually about 23 or 24,000 a year in the United States, even though you don't really hear about it. And really, that was the purpose of my article. Because, I mean, so many studies show that no one knew that stillbirth was still a thing, like that still happened until it happens to them, right? And as if the experience isn't traumatic enough, you also have to deal with like the initial shock of like, wait, what? This still happens like in 2020 too, right? In the United States. So the article was really focusing on, on sort of informed consent law which is about empowering patients to make decisions. Um, And I used a similar framework to argue that we should be notifying pregnant people. We should be warning people. Well, we should be disclosing that this risk exists, right? And I'm not trying to scare anyone, um, but- You said that the risk exists. That the risk exists, Mm -hmm. yes. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to scare pregnant people. Like it's still a very, very low risk. Just by comparison, most everyone knows about the risk of SIDS, right? Sudden infant death syndrome. Stillbirth is ten times more ten times more common than SIDS, so it's it's very it's a that's a strange disconnect to me that no one knows about stillbirth even though it's ten times more common than SIDS, and also uh, what the article does is look at uh, what other countries are doing because there are other countries that are successfully reducing their stillbirth rates. Uh, England, Scotland, now Australia is trying to do something also. And part of what they're doing includes education. It includes education about the risk. It includes education about the connections between smoking and stillbirth. It includes education about paying attention to how the baby's moving in your in your body, in your, in your belly is what I was going to say. So being aware Um, And that's helping other countries reduce their stillbirth rates. So I'm arguing that we should be thinking about something similar here. A little bit in the background, what were some of the reasons for there not being informed consent or just more information for uh, for patients? It's not a perfect perfect analogy because really informed consent is more about like when you're making a specific decision like about a procedure. Um, But I argued for more like a broader picture of just that pregnant people should be aware of like what is happening in their bodies and what and what can happen. Why don't we talk about it now? My goodness, that's a a question a lot of us would like to know. (laughs) Um, I think it's because it's so rare. Right. And there's this sort of this thought of like, why scare people when it's probably not going to happen, which is true. Right. But. But I also quibble with the idea that like pregnant people are going to fall apart if they learn about this low risk. Sure. One of the things I remember from the from the article was this kind of sense of paternalism yeah. in the med- in medicine. Yeah, there's a there's a sense that like you don't need to worry about this, and that's a doctor in a doctor deciding that patients don't need to worry. You don't need to know. You don't need to worry about that. And that's a very paternalistic thought. I mean, that's exactly what we've moved away from in in informed consent law, because it's not doctors making decisions and choosing what patients get to know. 
And I, I argue that the same thing should happen with, within sort of like a st- within a stillbirth context. So this pregnancy, sorry, this research about pregnancy loss has for you naturally has led to addressing abortion. Yes. And <clears throat> what I'm finding out are the many intersections through your work actually, uh, many intersections between abortion and pregnancy loss. Yes. So, so what I'd like to start with then first is just a basic question. What are the rates of abortion and pregnancy loss, which includes miscarriage and stillbirth? That's a difficult question to answer because we don't have good, well, I don't think we have good data on stillbirths either, but we really don't have good data on miscarriages. I mean, you could have a miscarriage and not even know right? You can just mistake it for a late period. That happens. That happens a lot. And, and so, and, and we don't actually try to collect any, like nationally, we don't collect data. Um, certainly there are studies about how, how common miscarriage is, and it is. It's like one in four pregnancies, but we don't have like good national data. I mean, it probably translates to, you know, a million miscarriages a year, about. If you add in the stillbirths, we're at like a million and 24,000. We do have data, I think it was back from like 2014, that it was roughly the number of miscarriages is equal roughly to the number of abortions that were happening in this country. So it's, one fourth? It was, yeah, it was close. Yes, it was close to like 20, 25 percent. Um, were, they were even, though. They were even. Um, and I, I have to go back and look at that study to see how they define miscarriage to whether it included preg- whether it included stillbirths, too. But the point is, we had we have just about this we have a similar amount of pregnancy losses as we do abortions every year but you really wouldn't think that right you think the emphasis the all the emphasis is on the number of abortions that happen and of course that's going to flip now right now that abortion is increasingly illegal um, in numerous states we're going to have fewer abortions especially recorded abortions obviously we're going to have fewer legal abortions i should say we're going to have a lot, we're going to have more pregnancy losses. We are. That's something that kind of gets lost in this debate quite a bit. You know, there's this idea that now that abortion can't happen, that a baby will be born. And that's just not true, right? Yes, yes, the, chance, the chances of the baby being born are higher than the chances of the, of the pregnancy ending early. But still, we're, gonna, we're going to have more pregnancy losses. If you have more pregnancies, you have more pregnancy losses. Um, and especially actually with respect to stillbirths too, if there's not too many stillbirths are due to abnormalities, but there are some. And now if there's no ability to terminate once you learn of those abnormalities, we're going to have more stillbirths also. So you mentioned um, different states and the laws in different states. So that leads me to my next question. And you have already sort of invoked it, but um, everyone knows about Roe versus Wade. So that's the landmark 1973 Supreme Court decision legalizing abortion. But what I found out after it was overturned is that it seemed like most people didn't fully understand all of the nuances of what it meant Mm -hmm. in terms of the federal constitutional right to abortion versus the power various states have. So can you explain, can you explain that? And then can you help our listeners understand the full meaning of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, the decision that overturned Roe? Yeah. What Roe did was before Roe, we had numerous states, I think we had numerous states that banned abortion at a certain, whether it be at a certain point or whatever, but the states had control. And what Roe said is, no, there's a federal constitutional right to abortion up to viability, which meant the states had to legalize, right? Um, What Dobbs did when it overruled Roe was just say, no, there is no federal right which then translates back to states being able to control, right? So yeah, what we're- Simple as that. Yeah, it's simple as that. Mm -hmm. Um, That now states get to pick whether abortion is legal or illegal. And, you know, there's there's some states that haven't banned it yet that we fully expect will, like Nebraska is one. Um, There's other states like ours that it was immediately illegal because we had what's called a trigger law. Um, when all the dust settles and the states that we expect will ban that just haven't yet, it's going to be about half and half. It's a blue-red divide. It's going to be about half and half. And, you know, yes, blue-red, but also 
I mean, Kansas, for example, I don't mm -hmm. know if I'd call them blue or red, right. Right. That's a good point. Um, but Kansas is, is just had a, a referendum that the voters rejected. And Kansas, and this is actually a good point for the feds versus states also. Kansas's state constitution, the Kansas Supreme Court had interpreted Kansas's state constitution to guarantee the right to abortion. And then, the, and then the legislators tried to get the voters to overturn that, and the voters said no. But so that's another option. Even if there's no federal right, there might be a state right. Um, so that's another way states uh, are you know, controlling this now. This year, in August, you published a, an opinion piece in the New York Times, and you have a uh, forthcoming article to be published in Vanderbilt Law Review. And the latter is titled, Abortion, Pregnancy Loss, and Subjective Fetal Personhood. So in both pieces, you mentioned that the line between abortion and pregnancy loss has always been blurred or blurry. Can you explain this? How has the rhetoric of a, the abortion debate affected pregnancy loss? Okay, I'm gonna separate those two. Let me let me do the blurriness first. And I need to give a shout out also to my co-author, Matt Green, Greer Donnelly is at University of Pittsburgh School of Law and she is a wonderful scholar and a wonderful friend. Is she your co-author on the Times yes, piece and, yeah. <laughs> and the uh, article? Yes, in, yes. Okay. We've done both. Sorry we did both that. together. Oh, no, you're fine. Well, the blurriness first. Um, there's a lot more overlap between the two than I think is commonly thought. Some of the similarities we ran into, I mean, first off, it's a, it's a pregnancy ending without a live birth, right? It, I mean, they, they, they are very, like, plainly similar in that sense. Other similarities we ran into is um, race and class. Uh, black, w black women, black pregnant people disproportionately have accessed abortion care when Roe was still good law. Uh, they also face a higher risk of stillbirth and a higher risk of late miscarriage. Right, as double, um, they face double the risk of stillbirth. That's more of a public health issue. Can you explain why? I mean, why is that? Why is that the case? I access to good health care. It's it's access to health care. It's insurance disparities. It's it's racism within the health care. Right. It's the individual racism. It's it's the structural racism. I mean, it's the same reason why we the black um, maternal mortality rate is so much higher and the black infant mortality rate is so much higher. They're all it's all the same. It's all the same reasons. Another thing that's similar about uh, uh, abortion and pregnancy loss is like the physical experiences, whether it's an early, I mean, it depends on the, the time in the pregnancy, right? But most, most abortions are very, very early and most miscarriages are very, very early. And like what actually happens physically is the same thing. And if, if we're later in pregnancy, like the, the surgeries or the procedures, it's the same. It's the same thing. I think you mentioned a lot of the medications. Yes. Right. Well, medication, abortion, um, those are the same drugs that are actually used, that are prescribed. Well, they were prescribed, I should say, um, for if, if, if it's like a missed miscarriage. So unfortunately, like if you go in at eight weeks and the, the baby stopped developing, but the heartbeat is still going. Um, what doctors prescribed was medication abortion, the two pills that go together, um, which is wrong. We shouldn't call it medication abortion because it's for other things. Um, it's for miscarriage management, we call it. So it's, this, it's the same medication, but now doctors can't do that in certain states, including ours, because as long as there's still a heartbeat. That's fascinating. You said miscarriage management. And they call it miscarriage management. We tend to have euphemisms medically for things that are abortion, mm -hmm. but we don't call it that. Sure. Um, we call it miscarriage management. We call it ectopic pregnancy treatment. We call it selective reduction. All of those mean abortion, but we've developed euphemisms <laughs> in, in those contexts. Depending on the context, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and another thing I just want to say about the blurriness about uh, abortion and pregnancy loss is some of the stigmas. I was amazed at some of the stigma. You know, there's a silence surrounding all of it. Like, no one's supposed to talk about it, right? And it's all rejecting sort of this, like, paternalistic, not paternalistic, patriarchal, a motherhood. Right, whether you failed naturally within pregnancy loss or you failed because you chose to fail with an abortion. But it, and then there's so much overlap. You'll read this literature about like a person who's had so many miscarriages and they describe themselves as like a baby killer. That's so much of that stigma has just sort of overlapped and it's so sad to see. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, rhetoric about mm -hmm. the abortion debate, this is something I could talk about for a long time. Something that's really frustrated me about the abortion debate for a long time is that pregnancy loss is not in the picture, right? And that's from both sides. 
um, because the anti-abortion side wants us to believe that every pregnancy not terminated will end up with a living baby. And the abortion rights side wants us to believe that every pregnancy not terminated will end up in forced parenthood. The millions of pregnancy losses that happen every year are just erased. Like, they just don't happen. Not discussed. Uh, they're not discussed. There's this binary, right? Like, abortion or living baby. And it's, it's just, it's not true. Like, millions of us know that that's not true. Another thing that I think has really affected the experience of pregnancy loss is is some of the anti-abortion rhetoric about, you know, life begins at conception. Well, if that's been drilled in your head for four decades and you miscarry at eight weeks, like that's a very different experience than had you not heard that for four, for four decades, right? And on the other side too, the uh, choice rhetoric. Choice implies control, right? My choice, that implies you have control, but so little about reproductive life is actually able to be controlled. And I think that increases some of the self-blame that people can experience with pregnancy loss. So, you know, they, they tend to be like separated, like these are two different things, which is silly because a lot of people experience both, right? So even that separation is silly. Um, but we also like forget to look at how things from the abortion debate have also affected pregnancy loss. So what I thought was interesting is in the Times, or uh, opinion piece, um, which is based on your article, that you propose a solution. So can you talk about that? It's a different model for recognizing the life of the fetus while not necessarily offending the abortion right advocates. Yeah, the purpose of, of what Guru and I wrote, there's been a longstanding um, hesitance on the abortion right side to really talk about pregnancy loss. Um, and it's, it's not difficult to understand because it's, well, if you acknowledge the loss in pregnancy loss, right? I mean, just think about it. Like, we lost the baby. Well, as soon as you say we lost the baby, you know, that's something that abortion rights, the abortion rights side has just tried to avoid, right? And actually, historically, they've sort of opposed things about pregnancy loss. But these days, they're just trying to av avoid as much as possible. Because they don't want to acknowledge it as a, as a baby at that, at that point. Right, they don't want, you know, it's, it's not a baby, it's, I don't know what it is, but it's not a baby, right? It's, sometimes you hear like it's just cells or tissue or something, but it's not a baby. But so many of us know that like, you know, at some point in pregnancy, it, it becomes a baby. So what, what Greer and I were really trying to focus on is that like you can, acknowledge the right to abortion and also still acknowledge that people um, suffer pregnancy loss and grieve and and to them it was a baby right and really the whole answer of what Greer and I were focusing on is that to them right it's subjective what we want to propose is like we can we can recognize pregnancy loss right and we can recognize that those people think that maybe they lost a baby but that doesn't all of a sudden mean that like every pregnancy is a person from conception, right? Those are two separate things. Um, we're trying because, to, to be a little bit more comfortable with the ambiguity, I guess. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think I think common sense, we kind of all are comfortable with the ambiguity, but the abortion debate is not comfortable with the ambiguity. Right. And what, what Greer and I were trying to argue is that just because someone, you know, had a stillbirth at 28 weeks and thinks that that's her baby does not mean every fertilized egg is a person from conception. And we can validate that pregnant person's view, right? We can recognize that pregnant person's view, but that doesn't mean that legally all of a sudden every fertilized egg is a person, right? And that's probably where we're going next on the abortion front. We, we got one of the feedbacks we got um, from the New York Times op-ed. Um, a woman wrote a story about how she had a 10-week miscarriage and, and how we were supposedly denigrating her loss, right, by even talking about how miscarriage and abortion in the same sentence. And that's, no, no, I fully support that you lost your baby at 10 weeks and I apologize and that's, that's awful. It's just that we don't think that that necessarily means that every fertilized egg is a babe, is a person as of conception. Well, I think that's all we have. Jill, thank you very much for being here with us today. Short Talks from the Hill is now available wherever you get your podcasts. 
For more information and additional podcasts, visit arkansasresearch.uark.edu, the home of research and economic development news at the University of Arkansas. Music for Short Talks from the Hill was written and performed by local musician Ben Harris.